you've got most people in the room. Nilima, can you round up the rest of the crew over there? Here too. Shandas, you can sit in the front if you want. Bibi, there's seats in the front. We can keep an eye on everyone. Okay. All right. Great. Welcome, everyone. Can I have this table's attention? <laughs> Uh, hello, they're my bosses, so I can't really be that mean to them. Um, good evening. <laughs> that's, that's a little later. Um, good evening. My name is Kiran Malhotra. I'm the Executive Director at uh, Thai Silicon Valley, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for a fantastic session of my story. Um, what I'd like to do is to give a little bit of a background about Thai for some of you who are new in the room or some of you who love to hear my speech and to see who has memorized this speech for coming over and over to Thai events. Um, and um, to uh, set the stage for the context about who we are and what we do and why we do what we do. So first of all, I'd like to see how many members I have in the room. Most people are members. How many non-members? Okay, so that's not too many. We can gather you all up before you leave in the, in the uh, evening and make sure that you all become members before you leave. It's only 30 cents a day. 30 cents a day, it's practically free for membership. So Thai was founded right here in the Silicon Valley in 1992 by a group of entrepreneurs mostly from the South Asian region. And they came here, became extremely successful, and, uh, but they did this really by their education and with very little support or guidance. And they said, you know what? We want to get together and we want to help other entrepreneurs succeed. And so that's what they did. They came together on a monthly basis. They started telling their stories. They would in invite other successful entrepreneurs of the time. And lo and behold, from 1992 to now, almost 20 years later, we're in 57 chapters, 14 countries, and the sole mission and purpose is always to foster entrepreneurship. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about becoming one, if you're supporting one, if you want to be one, you are welcome at Thai. Um, and that is our mission and that has always and will always continue to be our mission. We have four major stakeholders of Thai. We have our member community. Many of you are our members. Um, we have about 2,000 in the valley and we have about 14,000 members worldwide around our global chapters. Um, we also have our charter member community. Our charter members are highly successful entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, highly successful corporate executives or academics, and they're invited to be a part of the ecosystem um, because we ask of them one very important thing, and that's their time and expertise. And they give it back very freely. So they serve as mentors, they serve as um, board members, they serve as uh, leaders for the programs that we put together, and um, I would like to see a showing of the hand. I know lots of CMs are in the room today, so can I see all the CMs? Raise your hands high. So the rest of you should take a look around and go and sit next to them, get to know them. They're, they're wonderful people, and I promise you, you'll make a very good, solid connection and a, a friend and, you know, and good advice by getting to know these people well. I'd like to point out a couple of, of um, CMs in particular. Actually, there's more than a couple. I actually have four board members in the audience today, starting with our president, Vish Mishra. Thank you, Vish. Uh, and our charter member chair, Mr. Venk Shukla. Venk is also the uh, chair of the Thai Angels, which I'll talk a little bit about a bit later. And then we have our program chair, Naveen Bisht. He oversees all of the programs here at Thai. And then we have our membership 
uh, chair, Morley Rungarajan, and a long time, all these folks are long time charter members and they have dedicated their time to many things, but a board seat at Thai is really a hands on thing. And so we, I ask a lot of them and they do it freely. So thank you for that. And thank you to all the charter members. We call the charter members the backbone of the organization because they provide the mentoring and they provide a lot of the strategic guidance and oversight and time to make sure that this organization succeeds. Then we have our third category of um, stakeholder, and that's our sponsor community. So our charter members are the backbone. Our sponsors are the lifeblood. And they, uh, we have about 40 plus sponsors from the VCs to the law firms to corporate to service providers in the valley and beyond. And we couldn't do the programs that we do. We couldn't do these programs or our TICON program without the support, very generous support of our sponsors. So we thank them very much for their support as well. And then we have a fourth category, which is made up of all the other three categories, and that's our volunteers. So on my staff, I have four people and myself, five paid staff. However, all of the other stakeholders are, are volunteers from the charter member, sponsor, and membership community. So everybody that you see from the people who are helping us at the door, the, you know, the board members, the people who are putting together the programs, the, the folks who put together TICON, it's all volunteers and my small staff. So without that, that's a very unique thing about Thai is the, is the people who are willing to come here, be part of the ecosystem and volunteer and give back their time. So thank you to the volunteers who helped make this possible as well. Um, I'd like to point out we have a, a lots of different programs that we do at Thai. We do about 50 to 60 programs a year. And then in addition to that, we do our huge conference, TaiCon, which is held in May. Um, we have all of our forums, our Thai Women's Forum, our Growth Company Forum, our Economic Forum. Uh, we have our special interest group, which are across the five technology verticals. So they are social, mobile, cloud, energy, and life sciences. And we have a mobile event coming up a week from today here in this very room. Um, and so check out our website. That should be a, a really good event, a very interesting event. We have our Thai Institute sessions. Those are the practical, hands-on um, sessions for entrepreneurs, how to grow your business, how to run your business, how to start your business. Um, and actually we have a Thai Institute event coming up on September 28th, right Murley? Yeah. 28th? What's the title of that one? Mer Mergers and Acquisitions. So that one is going to be done by a very um, prominent attorney from one of our sponsor communities. It's going to be a very good event also. Um, we also have our networking mixers, purely networking opportunities for you. We um, do a Mentor Connect, a Startup Leadership Program, and then I'd like to point out two, two special programs that we launched very recently. The first program we launched is this one, was launched in April of this year, My Story. And these programs, we have featured entrepreneurs who have had very successful exits um, in the last six to 18 months. Um, and that series has, has uh, become extremely popular. People really like the series, and um, we've had good, good feedback from those those um, programs this year. And those, those programs are always held on the first Tuesday of each month, except for this month, because we uh, felt that it might not be good to hold it right after the long weekend. But we do have another one coming up next month as well, um, and then also the month after that. Actually, we have them through the end of the year, right, Naveen? Yeah, through the end of the year on the first Tuesdays. The other program that I wanted to, to uh, point out was, is our Thai Angels program. How many of you have heard of Thai Angels so You've heard of Thai Angels. How many of you are looking for funding? Or know people who are looking for seed funding? So Thai Angel, that's it? I think there's more. Um, Thai Angels is the place for you. We launched this program a year ago in August. And we've funded 10 companies since then, um, roughly half a million dollars a piece per company. And it's become an extremely successful program for us. We, um, our, uh, our, our monthly meetings are held on the third Monday of each month. It's, the applications are accepted on a rolling basis for the entrepreneurs, and they go through a screening process, and then three entrepreneurial companies are selected to present to the Thai Angels each month. Um, we have the chair of our Thai Angels right here, Vank Shukla. Uh, we have a couple of the steering committee members here, Vish and Vank, and um, I think that's it in the room today. But if you're interested in Thai Angels, I urge you to talk to one of them, talk to me, or you can simply go to our website, look at, there's a Thai Angels link right there on the website on the top right corner, click on that. It's self-explanatory um, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful program for us. 
Um, and then lastly, I would like to point out TyCon 2012, May 18th and 19th, so mark your calendar because we're going to get started. Uh, we're, gonna, we're in the planning stages now and we will kick off in January as we always do. And then I would like to thank my team, the staff, and also the board of directors for making sure that we are uh, we always put on these quality programs and that we continue to provide the cutting edge and most um, amazing programs for all of our membership and stakeholders. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Naveen so he can introduce our speaker for the evening and thank you for your attention. practicing doctors in the room? Wow, I wasn't expecting anyone. <laughs> and how many non-practicing doctors? Uh, not the PhD physics or something. I believe something abnormal obesity. Oh, that's a dangerous one. <laughs> anyone, uh, anyone trained as a, like, a doctor of medicine, as they say, but not practicing it? Other than our speaker. So, okay, so now next uh, trivia question is, how many of you are um, entrepreneurs in the healthcare IT industry? Wow. And how many of you are trying to do a startup in healthcare? Okay, great. So, um, now the question is, I'm sure you, every day you ask yourself, how do you crack the healthcare IT success code? So as you know, healthcare IT industry has been, uh, presents a lot of opportunities. At the same time, it has plenty of challenges. And uh, some of you may have, uh, may know or may remember Jim Clark. Does anyone remember Jim Clark? Yeah. One of the legendary entrepreneurs who not only founded Silicon Graphics and Netscape, uh, found, felt that there was a huge <laughs> opportunity, or rather gigantic opportunity, in streamlining the paperwork which existed in the medical records history and founded Healthion in 1996. And it was backed by premier venture capital firms, uh, Kleiner Perkins and NEA at that time. But uh, as he went into it, he found that there were a lot of challenges, so he narrowed down the focus of the company and from the earlier vision he had, and later on merged it with WebMD, which still uh, another successful company in the healthcare IT industry which still operates today. Similarly, we have our entrepreneur today, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, standing right there. Um, he started a company called Quantros, and even though he's trained as an internist and cardiologist, that's why I asked the question of practicing doctors not practicing it. Sorry, the doctors trained but not practicing it. He uh, founded a company called Quantros to uh, provide data management and decision support solutions to impact the patient saf safety and, and um, patient care monitoring and also help establish it as one of the market leaders with over 40% market share, uh, serving over 2,300 healthcare facilities across the United States. And then he successfully sold the company to um, uh, a private equity firm in San Francisco called Francisco Partners for a healthy valuation last year. So with that, I would like to invite Sanjay Kumar, Sanjay, he writes here Sanjay, I don't know how it's pronounced, but <laughs> to share his amazing, colorful, and exciting story here, and after that we'll have a question and answer session. So let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Naveen, and thank you very much to Ty, really, for giving me the opportunity to come and share my story with you. Uh, Every story has a beginning somewhere, and uh, our story actually has California built into it all over the place, even though we didn't start in California. Uh, we actually started back in Louisiana a long, long time ago. Now, my journey behind every entrepreneur, you know they're the serial entrepreneur, that's what they say in, in the valley, right? Uh, there's actually a serialness to my entrepreneurship, and I'm going to share that first of all together with you guys so that you can get to understand where the craziness in my life actually started. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I didn't start off by selling papers, actually. 
but little did my parents know that some of the genesis of my entrepreneurship actually was beginning at a very early age. Now, just to give you guys at least a little bit of a brief background, I didn't grow up in India. I was about four years old when my parents transported me to a country called Nigeria in 1969. And uh, every year, we would actually go back to India for a holiday. And I used to love sweets, you know, love sweets a lot, but my parents wouldn't give me money to just go buy sweets. So we came up with a very good idea. We cast my cousin, who actually is also in the valley over here, used to work for uh, P and um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, is now an entrepreneur himself. We came up with the idea to earn extra pocket money by selling lemonade. Well, a couple of lessons learned. We only did that on vacation. So never make a business that's only seasonal or vacation oriented. You're not going to go too far. And you didn't really make much money if you couldn't productize it. But now, today, lemonade is big business, right? Productized. Well, that didn't stop there. At age 15, when I was in high school, again, in order to live up to a lifestyle of a high schooler, needed more pocket money than what I was getting at home. <laughs> and I got a car pretty early in life from my dad. And what did I do? Well, there was no Netflix at that time, but that didn't stop anybody, right? When did that stop somebody? There were enough Sindhi brothers that I knew in Nigeria. <laughs> Believe me, there were a lot of Sindhi guys over there, okay? The whole business community there was all Sindhi brothers. So rallied some of them together. Now, they would actually dub the latest and greatest movie titles. I would package them into the back of my car, and my parental network was very strong. And all my dad's friends and all would love to get movies at home, including titles that you don't want to know about. Um, but really, literally, it worked out very, very well and taught me a lot. Now, that business, believe it or not, when I was leaving for college, I actually managed to offload for the inventory as well as for the customer base that I actually had. Uh, not for a very good valuation, but, you know, got me back something. Now, uh, movie rentals to literally showcasing movies back in college. Well, again, there was a need. You know, where I was in college, believe it or not, there was no theaters, there was no entertainment, but you needed to live up to that lifestyle. So we actually did some of all of that. Now this is just to highlight that you can be quite ingenious in terms of literally coming up with ways to live up to a lifestyle. So we used to actually show movies as well as organize live concerts. And finally to healthcare. Finally it dawned on me that all of this was probably going to take me down the wrong path. Time to get away from that. But um, just to get you guys to understand, in uh, Nigeria, when Nigeria was really, really uh, very uh, much flourishing, everything was available for free. Uh, the government provided everything. Um, but eventually, the country actually began to deteriorate, and then everything was charged. So patients would actually come to the emergency room, and they would get turned away because they didn't have gloves, or they didn't have glasses, or they didn't have needles for suturing. They would be actually be given a list of things that they had to purchase before they could actually be treated or before they could get operated upon. So myself and a few young doctors actually came up with the idea of uh, rallying up businesses in the, uh, in the town and getting them to contribute towards basically medical packs, you know, so for emergency patients and all, and we would provide them at literally uh, very much at subsidized cost uh, to the population. But that turned out to be uh, you know, something that we did for about a year and a half just so that we could provide for the poor. And finally, uh, down to the actual journey that actually began. And as I said, this particular journey is actually rooted in years and years of revelation. And I know that there are a number of you over here that literally are here to learn about what happened through a journey. Well, a journey does have a stop. But the stop literally leads to a lot of learning over a period of time that you begin to get to understand that much more better. And uh, I have come to understand that if anything that I can do now as I go forward is to literally make sure that some of the mistakes that we made at Quantrose perhaps in our early years, some of the learnings that we had that led to our successes are the kinds of things that you know one would like to impart to other businesses that are coming up. And my hope is that today throughout my talk, I'll at least be able to share some of all of that together with you guys. Uh, where and when did we actually start? Very simply, I mean, 
Uh, first of all, a brief background to myself. As you guys have found out from Naveen, I'm probably a very, very dangerous physician as of this point in time. I would leave that to uh, Dr. Bindra over there and others to literally take care of you. I started off as an internist and cardiologist at a very young age. I practiced for about eight, nine years. Um, did my training uh, in Massachusetts and got very much interested into healthcare uh, IT and computing because I became affiliated with uh, IBM at a very early uh, age in my life. Uh, they wanted to basically have a physician guide them in developing a clinical informatics solution uh, for nursing home patients. And I got that opportunity to actually work with them and develop that. And that got me hooked. But there's another thing that you need in this country to stay, which is literally a green card. Now, I had my medical qualification, I had my MPH, and I had a master's in health planning and financing. And I ended up getting a job with what you might call CA. In those days, it was actually called HICFA, or now more commonly known as the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And my main job was to help. They had come up with a new program at that point in time, which was all about quality measurement. Um, Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services, for those of you that don't know, provides more or less funding for about 25% for all health care that is provided in this country. So anybody that's elderly or that has a end-stage condition, like an end-stage renal disease, funding for all of that comes from uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. But they would like to know whether the care that is being provided to their beneficiaries is actually of good quality or not. That was the whole premise. And they actually appropriate monies to each and every state uh, through legislature to actually allow for funding of those kind of programs. My job was to design those kind of projects. You were literally given the benefit of working with this organization to come up with whatever kind of quality improvement uh, programs and projects to actually devise and deploy into the marketplace. Pretty simple uh, process, right? Well, we came up with very nice projects. Uh, some on congestive heart failure, some on uh, acute AMI, some on stroke, and the like. What did those projects require? You cannot improve if you cannot measure, as simple as that. So one of the things that we really required was for hospitals that were providing care to Medicare beneficiaries, we would require them to collect some data. Uh, so for example, on acute AMI, whether certain treatment was provided in the emergency room whether certain kind of treatments were provided within a given time frame after they were admitted to the ward. All of those kind of parameters were captured. The data would get collected by the hospitals very manually. It would get shipped uh, to the QIO, the Quality Improvement Organization for which, uh, for example, I worked. We would collate all of that data. We would analyze that data for all of those metrics, and then we would feed it back to those hospitals and to those doctors. But guess what? The time lag between that was nearly about nine months to a year. And you know who the messenger was to go and give the message, to give the message to the doctors regarding how well they were doing? It was people like us, myself and my colleagues. And guess what happened to us? Doctors don't like getting told how well they are doing, especially if it's one year old data. So we got slapped pretty badly. Now, we would go back to our parent organization, which is the dinosaur, which is the government, and tell them, you know what? There's better ways of doing this. I think we can actually collect data in a much more robust fashion and actually provide feedback back to the hospitals in a much more uh, rapid fashion, near real-time fashion. Guess what? The internet is coming up. Maybe we could use that. Well, they called me a madman. <laughs> they said, you must be crazy. Even HIPAA is not yet passed. You know, HIPAA is the for anybody thinking about entrepreneurship in healthcare, understand that there's something called the hippopotamus, which is the HIPAA, which is a HIPAA law. So it's all about security and safeguarding patient care data, right? Uh, making sure that there are enough safeguards to ensure that the data is not mishandled uh, inappropriately. Nobody would listen to the idea that the internet would literally be tapped as a networking environment to allow for collection of data, allowing for computation of all of those metrics and distribution of those results. So, like any other entrepreneur, you start looking for people that literally can bandy around. So whenever you meet somebody that even has, so I didn't have a computer background, apart from the dangerous work that I did with IBM, which I got to know about database design and all, 
I didn't really have a computing background. I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew what I wanted to achieve with that kind of a platform. So anytime you would meet with or give a talk, and there would be a semblance of an intelligent person with a computing background, you would latch on to that person and basically expound upon your idea. And in that process, I actually came across a gentleman called Rajneesh Mishra um, back in Louisiana. So, sorry, in my history or in my story, and I actually am meeting with people that were back in Oxford uh, practicing as well, uh, back in Louisiana over here. So it's a very small world. Um, I used to actually be deputized to Louisiana, I was in Baton Rouge, so I used to go nationally and give a lot of talks. So in one of those talks, I met up with a young guy, 10 years my younger, that actually told me anything on the internet could be achieved. You know, Entrepreneurs are very naive, by the way, they think they can actually conquer the world. So bear with me. So uh, in the early 1990s, the internet was evolving, and uh, most of the people were literally utilizing it to just share information and content. Um, but in January of uh, 1997, we actually incorporated a company, myself and two other partners, Rajneesh Mishra and Ali Rashidi, uh, who was also a physician. Needed somebody else to do some of the lifting on some of, some of the projects that we were actually planning to do. The company was called Healthcare Infotech, and it was incorporated in Baton Rouge. The objective was to create an internet-enabled platform that would enable near real-time continuous quality improvement. Uh, model was very simple from a business perspective. If we create such an environment, it would be so revolutionary that everybody and anybody that we knew would bandy up and basically bounce onto that bandwagon. And also, we wanted to do more for population-based health risk management. Uh, what happened? We actually, just like any other entrepreneur does, we were bootstrapped, both in terms of time, because we all had daytime jobs, we couldn't afford to give those up, and no entrepreneur should give their daytime job till they actually figure out how they're gonna pay for the other uh, component of their non-paying job. Um, and we didn't literally have people. We didn't have uh, people that could literally work for us because we couldn't afford to pay them, but we did have a lot of friends uh, that worked for us on a part-time basis to develop uh, some of the applications and prototyping some of the concepts that we wanted to actually evolve. Now, believe it or not, it's not only Bill Gates that can go out there and sell something that he did not have. We actually went out there and sold something that we did not have to Tenet Healthcare. And that was our population-based health risk management platform for managed care. Because managed care at that time, if you understand managed care, was all about focusing on paying doctors based upon certain performance and quality metrics. Managed care evolved that much more rapidly and much more faster, and they were interested in taking much more better care of their population than uh, CMS, because they wanted more efficient care, they were making money if they actually kept the patient out of the hospital, as compared to uh, some of the other healthcare environments. We also at that time launched a self-auditing standards compliance monitoring tool for hospitals. Uh, it used to be called ReviewMate. Later on, we labeled it as Accreditation Compliance Excellence Solution. Um, and we began to market that in 1999. But there is one lesson. It was a great tool because our customers actually told us to develop that tool. But it was a nice to have. It was not a tool that literally everybody wanted to have. They did not need it. They could do without it. It was saving them some time. So who was buying it? The much larger hospitals. And people like that. I mean, UCSF was a client of ours that paid $50,000 a year to use that apl application on a subscription <coughs> basis. Um, but we were still not there. And mind you, at this point in time, the company was not yet funded. And three years was literally running out, and you were working 18-hour days. Um, we did work on our prototyping of our CQI web application. Um, one of our partners, actually Ali Rashidi, dropped off in 1999. He said, you know what, enough of this. I'm going to go try to do something better with my life. And he went off to the CDC to actually do a lot of immunization database research and did wonderfully well over there. And later on, believe it or not, came back and joined the company. Uh, uh, Rajneesh Mishra at that time, actually, so here's where the tie-in actually begins with a lot of uh, tie. Um, 
Rajneesh decided that, you know what, uh, in order for us to actually know better what entrepreneurship is all about, we can't do that in Baton Rouge. I mean, how many entrepreneurial companies do you know in Baton Rouge? Help, help get Infotech. That's about it, right? Uh, so you're siloed, and you don't really have that much exposure. But he had heard of a conference. And this is back in nearly 14 years ago, guys, right? Taikon. So Taikon was famous at that time. And he decided to come. Uh, you know, we sat down and we said, hey, could we really afford to spend 2,000 bucks, you know, for you to go to Thai Town and, you know, attend Thai Town? Tough decisions at that time. Um, but, you know, he came over and uh, came to Thai Town and, you know, called me up and was all excited and was even more excited the following day. He had met up with a gentleman called Vish Mishra. You know, so Vish was even famous at that time, mind you, so now he's just that much more uh, famous. But we ran, he ran into Vish and Wish, from that time, literally has uh, or became a mentor of the team. Uh, we had several uh, phone conversations. I hadn't actually met with Wish till I actually moved to California, but over the phone got to know Wish uh, very, very well. And Wish guided the company in the beginning to begin to formulate the genesis of what the company was to become. And one of the key things for the company was we needed funding. So guided the team to literally prepare itself to seek funding. And um, luckily for us, we found that in a gentleman, a very, very nice gentleman, where if he had not ponied up the money for the company, probably we would have shut down. Um, the gentleman's name was Freddie Nolan. And the way that that particular story goes, and for those people that uh, literally have not met Freddie, but I think Vish has gotten to know Freddie very, very well, if he speaks a sentence and you understand two words, you are very, very lucky. Okay. Uh, he's, a, he's from Monroe, Louisiana. He made his money, uh, huge amounts of uh, money in the telecom boom. Um, Rag to riches story. Uh, and at a very young, uh, tender age, had three bypasses, heart, heart attacks and bypasses. And every time he went into the hospital, he had some problem or the other occurred to him. And on top of that, he had Rajneesh pressuring him nearly every uh, week to give him funding. So in the end, he just got tired, according to him. He said, you know what? What can this really do to me? It's a good legacy for me anyway. It will get rid of this guy bugging me. <laughs> so <laughs> he actually said, this is, that's his story. And he said, okay, you know what? Guys, here's $2 million. Just stop bugging me. Go do whatever that you want to do. I believe in you guys. He met with me, got convinced about what we were trying to do, did not really know that there was no product right there to sell, mind you. I mean, the product was still to come. Um, but we secured our Series A funding from a single investor uh, with, uh, of about $2 million, with another $1 million in exercise warrants. And when I say he was a gentleman, he truly was a gentleman to have. Um, you know, he had a very good business sense, but at the same time, let the team uh, guide the journey, and really was a great person to have on the board. Um, after we got funded, um, well, where would we get all the programmers? We were developing Java programs, mind you, for the internet. There were no programmers in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, we thought of moving over to Dallas, but no, but we had Vish that actually came to the rescue at that time again. Vish actually, uh, at that time, was, uh, with a company called InfoObjects. Uh, and if Wish remembers this correctly, we were incubated inside InfoObjects for about a period of about a year and a half, uh, which was on Warm Springs Boulevard in Fremont, California. It brings back a lot of memories of that whole area. Um, we operationalized, we moved over here with four people and literally uh, had a recruitment of sales and marketing staff uh, for headhunters and um, and we used some of our funds that were there to literally get some uh, help from info objects to help program CQI Web. Uh, that's, we even had t-shirts made up of CQI Web. We had to market what we were doing, right? Um, Tom Leahy, who is not actually here, and uh, really I have to share some sad news with all of you today. Yesterday, Tom Leahy's father passed away. Uh, so he's actually flown off to Chicago. He was actually supposed to be here today for this particular event. But he's uh, you know, a co-founder of the company, like any one of us that really made a lot of all of this happen. Um, I wish he was here, but uh, he joined us in September of 2000 as the VP of sales. 
and uh, started aggressively working on selling ACE because that was the only product, mind you, at that time that we had. And remember, we only had taken $2 million. And what happened in 2000? We came to Silicon Valley not just for the programmers, mind you, but every dot-com business was getting what? Funded, oh, cool loads of money, big time. But what happened at that time? Everything just went kaboom, right? But then in itself came the uh, resilience of the company. The company had to learn to survive. The company had to learn to literally do what it could to make sure that it didn't go down under. Um, Part of that was we had a product in ACE, and we successfully sold ACE to over 55 hospitals for ASP. It was an ASP application, so we were making about, not enough, but enough to literally keep the lights on and the doors open. Uh, we also hired a VP of, a lot of you might think, where does the name Quantros come about? A lot of, a lot of people have actually asked me in my history, what the hell does Quantros mean? Uh, are you from Mexico or, you know, where, where the hell, what, what happened over there? Well, nothing happened. We paid a guy six-figure income. He was our VP of marketing, David Kuhn, and he came over and he felt justified that he had to do something. Didn't like, you know, when somebody picked up the phone, Healthcare Infotech or HCIT, I mean, acronyms are no good. For physicians, acronyms are wonderful. I mean, we just love them. We have acronyms for everything. Uh, you should see hear the acronyms I have for my kids. Um, but literally what happened uh, at that point in time was uh, he didn't like the name and he ended up, he wanted us to choose the name and we didn't have the time so he ended up creating a name called Quantos. It was supposed to be like a Yahoo, you know, just a bucket all for anything. And that's how the name actually came about. And Quantos incorporated then as a California corporation and swallowed up Healthcare Infotech as the old corporation that it was. And we had customers. We had about 55 customers that were actually using ACE. We had Tenet Louisiana that was actually using our population-based health risk management application. And believe it or not, as they say, the stars sometimes tend to align themselves together. CQI Web, even though the grandiose strategy for that was to be literally come out with a subscription model kind of uh, endeavor for a free all, do it whatever type project environment did not work out. But the whole quality measurement component by CMS and Joint Commission got standardized in 2002. So the government came down and basically said, you know what, and the accrediting bodies for hospitals came down and said, you know what, these are the indicators we want all hospitals to measure. These are the clinical conditions that we would like you to focus on. And guess what? Go do it in the next six months. Well, nobody was ready for that. But guess what? Quantros was in a very prime position with a technology platform that could allow for that. So we rapidly turned around and put those projects onto CQI Web. And guess where we went? We didn't have a sales force. But we knew the Joint Commission website actually had a list of vendors that had committed to them that they would actually do it. So we had 50 people to call between myself and Tom and Rajneesh, and we did that. And guess what? We got some bites. The first client that we actually got was a small company out of Arkansas called American uh, Data Networks. And then the next one was Solution, uh, which had about 800 hospitals. They took on CQI Web. We later on relabeled that as RRM, Regulatory Reporting Management Platform. And very rapidly from 2002, 2003, the adoption began. And we began to get, you know, 100, 200, 400 hospitals on a royalty share basis. So we actually private labeled our platform to those partners. They sold it, and we got some revenue, very healthy revenue. So we began to uh, survive at that point in time. Uh, in 2003, we launched our safety and risk management platform. Using the same technology, same environment, uh, we had also identified a need with the hospitals. Remember, you're in survival mode at that time. You're talking to the hospitals regarding what to do. One of the other things that had come about at that time was the Institute of Medicine report had come out that had actually indicated that, you know what? American healthcare is not safe. For those of you that know me better, I've become a big proponent for healthcare safety and quality. Uh, my first book is called Fatal Care. 
uh, and it's actually aided, you know, to guide people in terms of how unsafe healthcare really is. By the time I finish talking over here today, about six to 11 patients would have died, you know, from preventable medical errors. So the premise of that particular application was to provide a framework where a standardized information could get collected on any one of these bad events and get cataloged so that we can learn from them and then we can improve our systems of care and continue to uh, do better. This is some of the founding team members from the beginning. I wanted to make sure that uh, give them credit for, the, uh, for all of those folks. Uh, Tom, as I mentioned, Venki was actually an acquisition we made from InfoOptics um, once um, he wanted to come over. We had a gentleman called Pawan Gupta who actually started with us right from the beginning and moved over together with us. Uh, Ratnakar, believe it or not, start, uh, graduated from his master's program and is still with the company uh, working in research. Uh, Rajneesh, as I mentioned to you, actually was with the company for the first five years of it and then later on on the board. Uh, Samir was there for about a couple of years and uh, Dr. Zagami, Lynn Zagami was with us for quite a bit of time as well. But these are people that I greatly recognize because they actually uh, gave birth to something at that point in time and persevered through the uh, growth phase at which time most companies literally fail. That's the period at which most companies fail. Uh, this is, uh, you will see this in other places or you can find it in other places, but we chronicled everything that happened to us. What we did based upon industry shaping events. So Quantros never actually wavered from its uh, focus. One could have said that, you know what, CQI web was not working out, why not give up on that? Why not do something else? We actually didn't give up. We continued to persist in terms of our focus. What was good for us was that that focus became even better for us because things got standardized. So the adoption actually happened in a much more rapid format. Um, so these are industry shaping events that literally tracked, we tracked for a period of time in terms of what we did and what we brought to our clientele. And overall, as you can see over the 10 year history of the company, we ended up acquiring nearly 30% of the market in terms of the commercial hospital space. Uh, legally, uh, from a legal standpoint, the team also got very experienced. Um, in 2003, we actually began to, um, when we came out with our safety and risk management application, there was another uh, vendor out there, again on the web, uh, competing in the software service model space called Dr. Quality. Unfortunately for them, they, had, uh, they were not doing necessarily that good or that well, so we ended up acquiring them uh, in 2003 and consolidating, again building out our own client base on that particular product suite. We signed a number of partnerships, as you can actually see. Uh, we acquired other products and other companies. We made about three acquisitions, no, four acquisitions in the history of the company and signed on a number of uh, uh, partnerships, including one with Oracle. I see Prashant in the audience, uh, you know, um, with Oracle to actually um, further the penetration of what Quantos was actually doing in the marketplace. Uh, for those of you that don't know LeapFrog, LeapFrog is actually an industry, um, within the healthcare industry, they're well recognized for what they bring to the table, which is really transparency in terms of measurement and sharing of all of that information. Uh, Medipol was a company that was actually acquired by CareFusion that they wanted to actually divest, so we acquired that off of them. Um, so the team got very, very um, knowledgeable about making some of all of these acquisitions, as well as assessing what would actually benefit us the most. Okay, and this is actually a highlight to show what we evolved as. So remember, we started off focusing in quality, compliance, and safety. Luckily for us, again, what happened was that all of these three areas confluenced themselves together for healthcare. So when hospitals were talking about quality, they began to talk about safety as being the uh, measurement component of it, meaning that if you're providing good quality care, you must be a better hospital in terms of the safety that you provided. And in order to achieve safety and quality, you needed to be compliant with all of the different standards and different regulations that you need to abide by. Uh, so we began to provide everything, and I divide up everything, 
Do they have point of care delivery systems like where EMRs and all of those guys basically focus on? And there was the below EMR or below the point of care where we focused on in terms of the kind of applications that we provided. And those ones in red are literally the areas that we attacked or that we addressed. This is our product suite that we ended up bringing to market. Why did we do that? Within each product suite, we had hundreds of hospitals, right? So for example, in safety and risk, we started off with event reporting manager as our first application, but using the same framework, we provided another application called disruptive event manager or feedback manager to create an upsell component within the client base. There were about 1,200 hospitals using us for safety and risk management. So that in itself served as a great upsell component as well as cross-sell across the different uh, applications that we had. So again, the lesson over there is that if you have a captive group of customers, how can you very quickly or rapidly begin to provide for more to the same customer base in order to continue to increase your revenue? Uh, I won't go into the details of this, but this actually shows you that, again, from a technology standpoint, people like Venki and the others literally established a platform or a framework that was very much standardized, meaning that we did not have a separate instance of a database for each and every hospital. We had the same data that was literally being uh, captured across all of the different entities into a single database because that in itself added a great value component to Quantros in terms of comparative and benchmark uh, data assets. So what did we actually achieve? As I've talked about, achieved a huge penetration in terms of market leadership. We were a totally, completely subscription-based uh, software service model with our data center in SADIS. I see Jagdish over there. So, you know, utilize some of the framework or infrastructure that, you know, you pioneered out there. Um, we provided, and, you know, we provided a SaaS model in healthcare at a time at which it wasn't that uh, common. It was, we were one of the pioneering companies that actually did that. After we did that, from 2005 onwards, actually, it began to catch on in healthcare. Uh, software service actually began to evolve much more rapidly and people would actually look for, forward to that. <coughs> this highlights to you the kind of clientele that we got, but as well as the upsell opportunities that we actually garnered. Uh, we started off with Tenet Healthcare with only about a million dollars every year. By the time we actually, uh, by two, 2010, we were getting over $2.5 million every year from them. So we increased our upsell opportunities uh, from each one of these clientele in terms of the recurring revenue base that we actually had. And I've just highlighted a few, but if you count these number of hospitals alone and number of facilities, they range into the hundreds, you know, three, four hundred right there. So what did we actually end up providing as value in Quantros? Number one, we established the largest independent data repository for quality and patient safety in the world, uh, I mean, unparalleled even as of today. Uh, the database that is actually there has a lot of value to it for comparatives and benchmarking purposes. Uh, we did that on a technology platform that was completely real time. You put in data, you get the results in analytics and comparatives and benchmarks right away. I know Oracle is, you know, that's why Oracle partnered together with us. Uh, we had a client base that included the who's who within the healthcare industry, from Kaiser to Tenet to about 34 academic institutions as well as about 24% of the most wired hospitals in the US. Um, we had great domain expertise. I'm not the only physician on the team. We had uh, three other physicians actually on the team that helped with it. Most of our outside folks were all nurses or risk managers or administrators from hospitals. People that sold into the uh, customer base were also healthcare focused. So we, we as a company made sure that we were aligned appropriately in terms of the domain and the knowledge and the expertise that we had so that we could speak the language and we could relate to what they actually were talking to us about. We established very deep uh, industry relationships. Um, 
you know, because of my focus on patient safety and uh, quality, I gave a lot of talks on that at multiple different conferences, and we actually ended up partnering with the groups like Lifra and others uh, to establish a thought leadership uh, position for the company. The DNA for success, we had a, we didn't again change our uh, model for the delivery of our application. We started as an ASP hosted application. There were hospitals that basically told us that they would not do business with us. Kaiser, for example. Okay? When we were in the contracting phase, they said no, they wanted to actually host the application on their site. We said no, we cannot do that. It would actually be an extra overhead for us. They sent an auditing team to actually come over to the Travis data center. And guess what? They ended up proclaiming that our data center was far better in terms of uh, the capabilities and securities that it provided and the systems that, that we had than even their own systems. Um, we had, we used Java from the beginning. It was extremely robust as opposed to a .NET platform. Um, we had an integrated data repository across all the clients and we made significant investments in R&D. Thankfully, our board was very, very supportive. I mean, if there's one thing that I can say about our board was the board guided the team. I mean, uh, just as a brief history into the team, uh, I was very much focused on the product development side from the beginning, uh, in, since the inception of the company. And in 2005, once the restructuring occurred and I took on the helm of the company, I would say that, you know, Vish, well, I think I was a student of Vish for about three years, trying to learn all the ropes about what I needed to know about running a company and really finding out what the hell an EBITDA meant or recurring revenue meant. I didn't know any of that. I can tell you that much. Um, but learned it pretty fast and uh, had about one.